Today we're talking with Rick Van Dusen, who's had a long career in music. You've done so many amazing things, and we're going to talk about them all. So let's go back to the beginning. Tell me about your original uh, music uh, experiences in school, and where did you go to school or grow up? Okay, I, I went to uh, Rosetown Composite High School, and uh, I started out playing. I was fascinated by brass instruments, so I started out trumpet and trombone, and I washed out on those, so... Uh, I decided I wanted to play the drums and so I went to dad and mom and I says, can you buy me a drum set? And they laughed and they said, well, we bought you a, a trumpet, we bought you a trombone, uh, I think we fulfilled our parental obligations. So uh, one summer I, uh, I worked uh, painting the fence and they paid me for that so I used the money to buy a, a crappy old snare drum or a crappy snare drum from the Sears catalog. And I beat the crap out of it until it fell apart. So at that point in time, they figured out I was serious. So uh, they went went ahead and bought me a drum set. And I was about 15 at the time. So uh, some of my school buddies and myself got together and we would jam. And we decided we'd form a band. So we became the Infrared Cranberry. Started out as the Electric Zoo and then decided that was not a hip enough name. So Infrared Cranberry seemed to do the trick. What year would that have been? That was 1970. Okay. Or, oh no, we started in 69 and then it went into 70. What kind of music did you play? Oh, we were playing rock and roll. I mean, we were playing a lot of uh, animals at that time. We were big into the animals and uh, uh, yeah, just uh, just the, the, you know, the classic rock stuff. Uh, so, uh, did that band play any gigs? Oh yeah, um, we, we played a bunch of gigs because uh, what I did was uh, I uh, did a letter and I sent it out to all the schools around and at that time school dances had bands and so we were charging uh, 65 bucks a night plus gas money. So we were making the magnificent sum of uh, $15 and we got a, a quite a few school gigs and that lasted about a year and then University happened. What, what year did you graduate high school? 1969. Okay. Yeah. And then you moved to the city? Uh, yes. Uh, I spent a year uh, working uh, in a grocery store. And uh, then, yeah, came into university to study psychology. Okay. And did that become a career then? Oh, no. No? No. Uh, after about a year and a half of psychology, uh, I kind of twigged on the fact that I wanted to be in music. but uh, So I, I went ahead and finished another year or so and uh, in the meantime did some playing. Uh, and so did you, you joined a band in Saskatoon? Yeah, joined a couple of bands, Was uh, played with a band called Shiloh uh, that we did, oh I guess two or three gigs. And then uh, in my second year uh, moved into an apartment and it so happened that a guy named Doug Hergott was in the apartment next door. So we became friendly. We actually jammed a little bit, but uh, he got a gig with a, a band called The Bar Six, and they were playing, and they were making 120 bucks a week, which was huge money at that time. And then we went for a beer, Doug and myself, and uh, he says, oh, yeah, what are you doing this summer? And he says, uh, we need to fill in drummers. So uh, uh, I had something planned, but I canceled that and jumped at the chance to play with the Bar Six, so uh, we spent the summer uh, doing uh, club dates in North Battleford, Lloyd Minster, Saskatoon, back when the, the King George had entertainment, and then uh, that lasted up until uh, the next year of university. And the Bar Six were quite popular. Who, who else was in the group? Uh, Steve Warbicki was in the group. There was a, a singer named Wanda Whitwell. Uh, who now goes by the name Wanda Cannon. She lives in Toronto and she's done uh, quite a few acting gigs, including uh, a series with Jerry O'Connell called My Secret Identity. So if you uh, Google her. But uh, yeah, she was a great singer and a very attractive lady. And uh, so it was pretty easy to get gigs with her. Tell me about the band Shiloh. Oh, Shiloh was just a three-piece uh, I lived in uh, Seeger Wheeler my first year and uh, had my drum set, so uh, 
we we used to have these big parties, and it just happened uh, that uh, the uh, bass player was uh, was there, saw me play, and and so uh, we put that band together. And like I say, it only lasted three or four three or four gigs. What kind of music were you doing in that group? Oh, same stuff, rock, uh, some uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, Ohio, uh, a lot of Guess Who with that band. They were big into the Guess Who, so we did that. And what happened to the Shiloh band? Oh, it just kind of disintegrated, just uh, because there were, you know, there wasn't a lot of playing that uh, it just kind of fell by the wayside. Did you find that most bands back then uh, ended because of lack of making money, or was it usually more personality issues? Uh, a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Uh, yeah, I think it uh, varies from case to case, but uh, in that case, it wasn't personalities. We all got along good, but uh, just uh, the band wasn't that good. So I think that's part of it, too. If the band is not good, eventually you get the message, and, yeah. and then you kind of fall by the wayside. Who is the leader of the Bar Six? A guy named Ron Kinetic, he played bass, and uh, yeah, it was it was his band, and he put it together, and uh, let's see, yeah. And how long were you in that group? Uh, just for the summer, so just... Uh, what year is that? That was 1971, I believe, yeah. Okay, and then what happens next? Okay, uh, went back to university... Uh, did some playing with the intensely vigorous College Nine, and uh, that was just just a hoot. A bunch of guys dressed in funny costumes, playing brass instruments and percussion, and drink until your face fell off. Right. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, I think the next thing that happened was Legend. Oh no! Oh no! Dave and the Dra uh, oh sorry. Okay, let me regress. Uh, I was playing with a band called Fourth Avenue. And that was a little bit different in that we had brass. We had a, a trumpet and a trombone player. So uh, we were doing a lot of the, the horn tunes of Chicago, uh, had Blood, Sweat and Tears. At that point, the Stones were using some horns, so we did uh, uh, some of their horn tunes. Uh, what was it, Brown Sugar? Yeah. So at that time, it was obviously popular to have all these big horn bands. Um, however, how, how did the bands justify making money with a big lineup? Oh, well, we did all right. Yeah, uh, let's see, we just had five people, because there was just uh, uh, guitar, bass, drums, and then the two horns. Okay. And who all was in that group? Uh, Len Taylor, who went on to be a big uh, political guy. Uh, I think he's uh, uh, MLA in, uh, was an MLA in North Battleford. Uh, Kelly McKay, who was a guitar player, singer, and myself, and then Ross Ulmer, who now uh, is uh, a big-time car magnet with Ulmer Shevolds, and John Duggleby, who was is a school was a school teacher in the in the system, and uh, so that lasted for a while. I can't exactly uh, remember how long, but when I was in it, I got a, a call from a guy named Dave Beck, and he said he wanted me to come and and join his band, Dave and the Drastics. And I says, well, no, I'm, I'm pretty happy. And, uh, okay, so that was one phone call. Well, five or six phone calls later, Dave Beck doesn't give up easy. And he's very persuasive. So, okay, I'll come out and jam with you guys. Okay, so I went out the jam, and in that band was Ed Kusharan on bass, and then uh, I think a shirt tail uh, relative of yours, uh, Bob Hawkness on guitar, and uh, the jam went good, and Dave was making pretty good money, and uh, the uh, material was good. Uh, we were doing some Eagles and and that kind of thing, and uh, I, I don't think we were doing uh, any country at that point in time. So anyway, I, I joined uh, Dave and the Drastics, and I had to get a suit, a drastic suit, and uh, yeah. So we played there for a while. That'd be in 72? Oh gosh, Terry. Um, okay. I'm going to have to beg, beg off on the dates. Okay. I, I'm not a big date guy. I can't really remember. So I have posted a whole bunch of Dave and the Drastic recordings that I have from 72. I'm not sure if you're on them or not. Right. 
but you uh, can go on YouTube and listen to Dave and the Drastics play. Oh, really? Two. Okay, I'll do that. And then that might, uh, you know, remind you a few other things. Okay, so Dave and the Drastics obviously were playing a lot of gigs. Fourth uh -huh. Avenue had a lot of gigs too. So all these bands at that time were you. Mostly playing in Saskatoon, or are you doing the whole province? No, nah, we were mostly playing Saskatoon. At that point in time, there was, uh, I don't know, by my estimate, in between 10 and 20 clubs that had music, uh, uh, live music, uh, six nights a week. So, you know, you could go from club to club and uh, and, and play steady. So, okay. uh, I, I don't yeah. envy young kids coming up now because there's... There's no place for them to play. I mean, and a lot of them are doing free gigs and they're playing jams. And and I understand that, you know, like uh, you you spend hours and hours learning how to play your instrument and you want to get out and do it. And, you know, uh, if they have to do it for free, it's it's not a good thing, but uh, it's something I understand. So let's go through some of these bands and talk about some of the gigs and stuff that you remember. So let's take the bar six. Did any gigs pop up? Did you recall anything interesting? Uh, okay, no, the, the gigs were right on spectacular. Uh, we played clubs. Uh, we didn't do any one-nighters. So, like I say, we were playing the King George, the North Battleford, the Lloydminster. That's the only three places I remember. Uh, what I remember about Lloydminster is we had two rooms. So Wanda had a room to herself, and then the four of us were in, in one room together. And I couldn't do that now, but at the time it... Uh, worked out um what do you uh, remember about the general vibe of the nightlife scene at that time when it was at, when it was at its peak yeah uh monday tuesday wednesday were very slow i mean uh you know like monday you just dreaded monday because you knew that nobody was coming in and you you, you gutted it out until thursday when people started to come in but uh yeah generally weekends were quite good you know thursday was uh not too bad, and then the weekends would be good. A lot of, a lot of people out, and uh, always fun times. Good response. What was the reasoning for the clubs then to hire six nights if, if they knew that they weren't really making any money? What From what I've heard, or what I understand, is that there was uh, some kind of legislation that required that there was, if you served certain... Uh, alcoholic beverages or something that you needed live music at that time. So I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, that's what I heard. So one of my favorite things to discuss is why this nightlife scene boomed in the early 70s and trying to figure out what's the reason, why did it hit then, and, and then I wonder how much of the laws of the time really were actually the reason. Okay, the big thing is lack of technology. I mean, when disco started to happen and the technology became that uh, people could, uh, you know, dance to recorded music and that, that's when it changed. But right back, back then, um, there was none of that happening. And so live music was pretty much the only option. And, and that's why I think, you know, that's why I think there was a boom. What was your role in the city in terms of, as a drummer, um, were there a lot of drummers on the scene? Where, how did you feel you fit? Oh, uh, I felt I, I fit very good because uh, uh, I was doing a lot of filling gigs. And uh, that was fun. Uh, that uh, people would call me, be, be, see me play, and then they would call me if, if you know, their band needed a drummer. So... Uh, I got that I could go into a gig and and uh, anticipate how a song was going to go, even if I hadn't played it before. So uh, I got big years, they call it. And uh, that served me well over the years. Right. Were you a member of the union? Yes, you had to be a member of the union. Uh, when I joined Bar 6, it was, uh, yeah, you had to, had to join up. So uh, I went into the union and... Uh, Harry Smith was the uh, secretary treasurer at the time, so he indoctrinated me, and yeah, I became a, a member of the union, and uh, it, it seemed like it was a good thing. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of good things about the union at that time. Do you remember if there were any clubs that 
actually did hire non-union players? I don't remember that. I, I believe that uh, everybody was a union guy. And when do you think that kind of faded away? Uh, mid to late 70s. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about 4th Avenue. Some okay. highlights or memories. Oh, uh, the highlight with 4th Avenue is our New Year's gig at the Marigold Cafe. And uh, yeah, we just just had a riot. Uh, back then, New Year's was a, a big deal. Uh, nowadays, not so much. But uh, in the 70s, uh, you could count on uh, playing New Everybody played New Year's. And you made at least twice as much money as you did on a normal gig. And so uh, uh, New Year's at the Marigold was fun. Uh, and again, we, we played clubs. Uh, I don't remember us doing any uh, one-nighters. Uh, there were a lot of one-nighters going on, and uh, uh, I'll get into that with uh, one of the later bands. Okay, let's talk about Dave and the Drastics. Dave Beck, was he booking his own gigs? Dave was, yes. Dave was booking his own gigs. Uh, Dave eventually uh, uh, became a, pretty much a, a booking agent. He bought Northwind Talent, and he ran that. But at the time, no, he was, uh, well, he was... He was Mr. PR. He was a talker. Uh, he could sell uh, refrigerators to an Eskimo kind of thing. And uh, yeah, it was a fun gig. Uh, enjoyed uh, playing with those guys. And we went on uh, for a while. Uh, played, uh, yeah, we, we played some clubs and then we played some one-nighters. I remember trucking out to Yorkton to play. And at the time, uh, when you came back, there was no uh, gas stations open. So we drove as far as we could, and then we camped out in front of our gas station. We got there about 4 in the morning. When they opened up at 8, we, we finished, uh, got our, our tank full of gas, and came home. But, uh, yeah, we had to spend some time in the parking lot. And, uh, yeah, so uh, worked with Dave for a while. And then I guess uh, Dave decided, he, now I'm not exactly sure how it went, but... Uh, at one point, Dave decided that uh, he wanted a change. So uh, he recruited uh, Hugh Mitchell, Doug Hergott, and Steve Warbicki to come into the band. Okay, so uh, uh, I remember there being some tension because uh, we didn't have much time to prepare. And Mitchell says to me, well, you and I got to get tight real quick. Yeah, we did. It was it was not a problem. So we, we started playing gigs as... as that on incarnation, and uh, we did a lot of fun gigs. We uh, opened up for the Stampeders on a, a number of Saskatchewan dates. We we played Wood Tick, and that was fun. We played Wood Tick and then piled into the van and uh, headed out to do the Stampeders. So you know you felt pretty pretty rock stars that the, you know you're in demand. And uh, the material was, uh, again, a lot of rock stuff. Uh, uh, Doobie Brothers, yeah, we are doing a lot of Doobie Brothers, Eagles. Uh, nothing real heavy. At that point in time, uh, uh, we weren't into anything real heavy. Uh, it was funny because uh, <clears throat> at, at that time you could play anything you want because rock and roll was fresh. And people would get up and dance to anything. You know, you could you could play a Blue Oyster called album cut, and people would still get up and and dance. Uh, whereas nowadays, if you're not playing the hits, they're just not interested. So now how how would the bands decide then what they wanted to play? Oh well, you would uh, you would listen to tunes, and then you'd say, oh yeah, I'd I'd like to play this. So you'd take it to the band, and they'd uh, never wanted to you know decide whether or not you wanted to play that particular song and uh, usually worked out pretty good. Did you have a favorite venue in the early 70s? Uh, well, you know, Jackson Yips, uh, downtown on 2nd Avenue were uh, big clubs at that time and uh, yeah, they were they were fun to play. Um, but uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the one-nighters were also fun. Because uh, you would play a high school gig on a, a Friday and then a town gig on Saturday. And uh, that's when there was a lot of that going on. Did Jackson Yips make more money as restaurants or did they make more money as nightclubs? 
I think I think the booze sales. Yeah, because uh, uh, I remember Don Yip. He was quite a character. He uh, eventually owned both Jacks and Yips, and he would conference with us every once in a while. He said, "I make money, you make money," and uh, so uh, yeah, uh, I'm sure that uh, the entertainment was a big part of it. Uh, oh, the food, but uh, I, I think uh, his liquor sales were what what drove the club. So Dave and the Drastics, when the lineup changed, the band went from a four-piece to a five-piece? Yes. And I think the money stayed about the same. I mean, Dave was uh, a, a really good salesman, so I'm, I'm sure he upped the ante. But uh, I remember uh, at that time making the magnificent sum of about 450 bucks a month, which was enough to live on. Yeah. And Why do you think you were the only member he kept? I don't know. Because uh, I guess there was no one to replace me. I, gu I guess at that point in time, I was as good as it got in town. <laughs> Who were some of the other top drummers in Saskatoon at that time? Oh, Wayne Rolak with uh, uh, Friendship that uh, later turned into Sun Band. Tom Cunningham with... Uh, oh, Trina. Trina, yeah. Uh... Those are the two I can think of off. Oh, um, uh, Rick of the Ravens drummer. Uh, I forget uh, what the, the gentleman's name. Okay. So, um, you said that you were living near Doug Hergott. Yeah. And you jammed. And so, how was it just coincidence that he ended up becoming in Dave and the Drastics? Or was there some other connection? Between the two of you, no, it was uh, it was uh, strictly Dave's doing. I mean, I never went to Dave and said, you know, you got to get Doug Hergott. It was uh, Dave. We, we used to go out uh, pretty much every night and watch people play, you know, and we'd see uh, the Society of Four and John Cherneski and uh, all those guys. We, you know, hop from club to club, but it was a a big deal. We'd go out to, to clubs and then. Uh, after the clubs, we'd go and jam till uh, five in the morning, uh, in the jam space. So, but no, I I never said anything to Dave. That was uh, strictly he he. Uh, I guess he had his eye on these guys and decided that uh, he needed the best players in town. Right. And so this is after Doug Hergott had already been in Society of Four. Yes. Yeah, Doug and Steve were in Society of Four at the time. Uh, Hugh was playing with the Kenny James Band. Okay, so you've got this lineup in Dave and the Drastics. That's a pretty hot lineup. And it lasts for how long? Just a few months. Uh, and then uh, Dave fired us. Um, I'm not sure what the real reason was. Uh, in fact, I can't even remember the reason he gave us. But he fired us, so I was uh, a little concerned. And then uh, Mitchell came over to my place and says, well, we're just going to keep the band together and we'll call it Legend and just keep going on. And without skipping a beat, we started playing gigs that next weekend. Yeah, because uh, there, was, there was a lot of gigs. Uh, I mean, you know, at that time, it was if you had a band, you could work. Yeah. And so Legend obviously had a really good run. And yes. And you released an album. Yeah. How did that come to be? Uh, that was, okay, the album came out, well, I was with Legend for two years, and then uh, my big thing was uh, I had in the back of my mind that I wanted to go to the U.S. to university, and that was going to be the be-all and end-all. So I was working towards that goal, and at that time I had given, given notice to Legend that I was going to leave them. Uh, I gave them uh, a good, good healthy notice that... Uh, so they could find someone. And uh, so they came to me and said, well, we're wanting to do this album. Uh, uh, I guess it was Dave's idea. And he says, yeah, we're going to do one side and then Society of Four will do the other. And uh, we'll give you an option. Do you want to play on it and just participate? Or do you want to actually invest and then reap in the profits? And so I decided I just wanted to play on it because I knew that... Uh, you had to sell a lot of lot of records to uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, make that up. So we went into uh, a church, a church hall, with uh, Rod Rolak and Jerry Bowers. They had a, a four-track yak, and we uh, recorded uh, our side of the album. And it was very interesting because uh, you had to put uh, all the instruments on two tracks because they double track the vocals. So that means that they, they would uh, do the vocals and then Doug had to redo them. So it was, uh, at that time you had to know what you were doing. And uh, we recorded the album. My, my big regret at the time is that we had no original material. And it was all just cover stuff. I mean, you know, you get a chance to record an album, which was a fairly big deal at that time. And we had cover tunes. We had some good cover tunes, but it uh, would have been nice. Uh, at that point, I wasn't writing any music, and, and none of us were, uh, you know. Uh, coming from Saskatoon, uh, the, it was kind of a sheltered that you didn't realize, like in Toronto, that you had to have original material. So we were coasting by on doing the covers. So did the legend kind of make their mark? Obviously one of the biggest bands. Did you feel at any time you were the biggest band in Saskatoon? Uh, yes. Um, we, we felt we were close with some other bands, Sun Band and, and Trina and people like that. Uh, of course, Trina buggered off to uh, Toronto to make their mark. Um, but uh, yeah, there, we were in the top. Yeah, I don't think we ever considered that we were head and shoulders above everyone else. We, we knew that, you know, there was a lot of talented people. But yeah, we were recognized pretty good. We got to, got to play a lot of the cream gigs. We did a lot of uh, university uh, gigs. At, at that time, uh, the university had Mark with Shakes in the upper Marquis uh, uh, Hall and used to have, uh, the place was packed and everyone was up and dancing and it was, those were marvelous gigs, I mean, you know. Good. Do you um, have any highlight gigs that pop in your mind? Anything you remember? Audiences, anything, set lists? Uh, again, uh, the Marquis Shakes were probably the highlight. We loved playing those. And yeah, we were we were big on campus. They used to the chief would interview us, and you know, uh, so we were BFDs on on campus, and that was a nice thing. Uh, as far as material, again, we were still playing pretty much what we wanted, and we, <laughs> uh, we were uh, we'd kind of get bored, so we'd do a lot of jamming on stage. We'd go into China Grove and play that for a bit, and then all of a sudden go into a jam, and then ten minutes later, uh, oh. What, what we're playing, oh, back into China Grove, okay, that's what it was. And people seemed to like it. They would still carry on dancing. And uh, the, the big tune was uh, higher and higher, your love keeps lifting me higher and higher. And then uh, all the chicks would get up on their guy's shoulders. And, and that, was, that was the number one tune at the time, the, the big dance floor filler. Do you remember much of underage patrons? No. No, never, never dealt with that much. Uh, I know that there was under underage people playing, but uh, uh, that was okay, wasn't it? I mean, uh, if you were in the band, you were allowed to be in the in the bar as long as you weren't drinking. Right. And you remember anything unique about the drinking laws at that time? Uh, yeah, it. Uh, they had just switched to the. It was twenty one for the longest time, and then they switched to eighteen. And I guess they had problems with high school seniors <laughs> going out to lunch and coming back to school drunk. So they bumped it up to 19. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people that weren't able to drink before were, were able to. And, and uh, I, I think that contributed to uh, uh, the music scene. Um, I remember on, in later years playing Windsor, Ontario and uh, with the circus. And uh, on Friday and Saturday nights, uh, the place was just crammed because all the kids had come from Detroit because the, the age is 21 there and in Windsor was 19, so they could drink in Windsor. And uh, yeah, so I, I think that uh, the lowering of the age contributed a lot to uh, with the clubs. Uh, kids, kids want a place to hang out and if they could do it legally at a club and drink, then they were there. 
were you doing any singing in these bands? A little bit, uh, not as much as I should have. Uh, with, uh, with Legend, we had uh, really nice three-piece harmonies. I never got in on that, uh, which uh, I regret now. I did uh, a couple of lead uh, tunes, but uh, quite frankly, uh, I'm not a great singer, and at that time, I was even less so. What was the deal with the PA systems you would have used in these nightclubs? Oh yeah, we had uh, we we brought a brand new casino uh, PA, and all that went through the PA was vocals. Uh, so you know, and and we actually played the Centennial Auditorium with that system. Uh, we opened up for Flash Cadillac, and because of uh, political considerations, we couldn't use the house PA because uh, we couldn't afford to rent it. So we used our, our little casino PA, and nothing was mic, no drums, uh, and so I had to be loud. And uh, yeah, so uh, at that point in time, uh, PAs were pretty min minimal. Out of all the nightclubs that you would have played, which room actually was the largest? The Red Lion. Uh, yeah, the Red Lion was kind of the, the plum club gig in town. Uh, and for the longest time, they didn't use local bands. And then they started using local bands if you didn't play any place in town. And then uh, finally we got in there. Uh, uh, I guess with Dave and the Drastics, we got in there and played a, a few times with uh, Legend. Uh, a little interesting side note is uh, at the Red Line, there was a band from uh, Edmonton called Privilege would come in every once in a while. And they had two lead singers. They had a guy named Mel Deegan. And then they had a tall, skinny kid in the back that would sing all the high-pitched tunes like Sherry Baby and uh, When a Man Loves a Woman and just sing the crap out of them. That was Steve Perry uh, from Journey. And uh, he was in the country at, time, at the time uh, dodging the draft. And then after that all blew over, he went back to San Francisco and put together Journey. Pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. A lot of interesting people have come through Saskatoon. Absolutely. I just um, saw uh, Nichelle Nichols from Star Trek. At yeah. The at the A4. And yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The A4 there. was a, a boom in place. Uh, they had a lot of variety. I remember playing in the A4 with a band called Firescape and... Uh, we, we were the opening act, and the headliner was a hypnotist. <laughs> Do you, uh, you mentioned with the Red Line that they didn't want to hire bands that played other venues. Was that a norm with any of the other clubs? No. No, they were the only place. Uh, but they could afford to because they were sort of the, the top-line club. I mean, you know, it was big, and it was uh, nice, and it... They hired the, the most beautiful waitresses, and so, you know, people were clamoring to get in there, and as a band, you wanted to play that place. And so by being the larger room, does that mean that you also had to be louder? Uh, I don't recall that, but uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, but then again, we still uh, played it with our little PA system. Was there any room that you did not like playing? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, there was a place called the Dell that nobody came to. They still had live music six nights a week, and it was, it was just dead, but, you know, if you had to fill in a week, you would do that. Right. Um, when we played Jackson Yips with Legend, uh, uh, like I say, we got along really well with Don Yips, so he would hire us from Monday to Thursday, and then on Friday, we'd go out and do a school gig, and then Saturday, we'd do the town gig. So, you know, we, we were on top of it. And what was the nightclub's kind of view in terms of, sometimes they hired local bands, but sometimes they were bringing, you know, American acts in, Vancouver bands. Yeah, yeah. No, the Red Line mostly did that. They would, they would hire uh, uh, big touring specialty acts. And uh, they had people like Joey Gregor Ash at that time had hits. Uh, who did uh, Put Your Hand in the Hand? Ocean. Ocean. Yeah. And, then, and so they would have that. And then they would have uh, 
uh, you know, big bands, big horn bands. Uh, HP Riot was just a smoking band from the States, and they did doing all the, the funky horn stuff, and, uh, you know, just great bands. Yeah, and we would just go out and just soak it up, because at that time, uh, the only place uh, you could get... Uh, musical influence was at the live gigs. I mean, you know, unless Ed Sullivan, well, all those bands were lip syncing anyway. So, yeah, you went out and you saw live bands and you'd try and rip off their licks and, and that's where you got your information. Right. No YouTube at that point in time. So how did the bands learn new material? Oh, well, just by ear. Picking it off the record. Yeah. The record. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, there were a lot of guys with big ears. Your dad was one of them. Uh, yeah, I remember taking uh, some songs to him. He said, oh, I don't know if I can play that. And then he did it. Yeah, uh, some Rare Earth and uh, uh, some Free All Right Now, yeah. Oh, well, he played the crap out of them. How did you feel that the Saskatoon bands measured up compared to these touring acts? Well, we were good, but we weren't that good. I mean, uh, these touring acts were probably, you know, coming from places like San Francisco and Seattle, and, and they would have the best musicians from those cities. And so, and, and you know, they were playing, they were on the road, they were touring and, and rehearsing a lot. So, yeah, they, they were just uh, one notch a ahead of us, you know. Um, but that was okay. We'd go out and, and we'd uh, hear them, and then we'd uh, try to emulate them. So what happens at the end of Legend? Uh, well, I don't know. When I left, they carried on. And uh, so uh, Legend went through several incarnations. Uh, the, uh, uh, a gentleman named Al Vicarious took it over after a while and toured it on the road. But uh, yeah, they kept going. So there was Legend for a long, long time. And... Uh, uh, I branched out, uh, I went uh, back to university to study music and played with a band called Fire Escape, which uh, again we had two horns and we were playing a lot of the, the funk stuff. We had a uh, uh, African American, well uh, I'm not sure he's from Africa, but he was, he was black, Kenny Atherton, and uh, so uh, we built, kind of built a band around him playing that, uh, that soul music. And this is in Saskatoon? Yeah. And we played a lot of one-nighters and that kind of stuff, uh, played in clubs. Yeah. So you didn't give up playing, but you gave up legend. So yeah. I don't know what the reasoning was uh, at that point in time. Like I said, I was preparing to go down to university. So, I, yeah, I went back to university, and I, I guess I figured I couldn't, couldn't do university and legend. So... At, at the peak with Legend, how many gigs a year would they be playing? Oh, well, we played every weekend. We played every week or every weekend. We were, yeah, we were we were busy. I mean, that was that was our livelihood. So uh, you know, whatever came up, we took it. Uh, we we'd go to Thompson, play there. What percentage of gigs would actually be nightclub gigs as opposed to one nighter dances and special events? Ah. Uh, I think about half and half, but you know, my my memory that that's that's a long time ago. Uh, I'm lucky if I can remember where I parked the car. Okay, so Fire Escape, where what kind of venues did they play? Uh, same venues. Uh, we played uh, the Red Lion and and we played clubs and and we did some one nighters. So uh, everyone was playing pretty much the same venues that. Uh, you know, you did the clubs, and you did uh, some high schools, and you did some, some town gigs. <coughs> um, and the reaction we got was, uh, was good, uh, even, even though the material was a little different than uh, pretty much everyone else was playing. Uh, people would still, still appreciate it and still get up and dance and have a good time. Did the, the disco era affect your... Uh live performing in any way? Yeah, I cut back on the number of gigs. I mean, when disco clubs came in, and of course the, the big disco thing was Saturday Night Fever with uh, John Revolta, 
And uh, yeah, I remember going to see that movie. And then after that, uh, the disco club started springing up. And yeah, well, you know, uh, people flock to something that's new. And well, they flock to a place where everyone else is. And guys flick to the, the flock to the place where the chicks are. So after Fire Escape, what happens? Uh, then uh, uh, I got prepared to go to university in uh, northern Colorado. And then just before that happened, I got in a motorcycle accident and broke my leg. So that kind of got put on hold. So I spent the year playing with uh, a couple of different bands, Windcraft, Windcraft and uh, Old Scratch. Uh, played some gigs with them. Saskatoon bands? Saskatoon bands, yeah. Who was in Windcraft? Uh, the McGew brothers, uh, Martin and John, and then a guy named Glenn Stace, who uh, went on to have a fairly good uh, solo career. And uh, yeah, we uh, played a lot, we played a lot of one-nighters with them. And uh, yeah, had fun. And Old Scratch? Old Scratch was Tom Tunick, Terry Collison, uh, Dale Dufers was singing at the time. Old Scratch had a, a lot of different member changes. They sort of sprang from my hometown of uh, Rosetown. Uh, Bill Hodge, who was with us at the time playing keyboards, and, and they started out uh, and uh, came from Rosetown, so there was a lot of Rosetown guys in there. Through all these bands that you performed with during the 70s, did any of them do any TV appearances? No. Uh, not that I recall. Any radio? No. Not, nothing. Any recordings beyond Legends album? No. And you mentioned earlier about doing a show at the Centennial Auditorium, and that was the Flash... Flash Cadillac, Cadillac and the Continental Kids. They were in what, American Graffiti was their claim to fame? Because they were like, uh, Sha Na Na, I don't remember, know if you remember them, but they were a, 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 a greaser act. They did 50 stuff and, and they did it really well and they were also quite hilarious. And uh, same thing with uh, Flash Cadillac. They did the 50 stuff and did it quite well and did it quite funny. So it would be the biggest attendance show you ever did in the 70s? Uh, I guess uh, uh, with the Stampeders we played Swift Current 3,500 people so I guess that was the biggest one at the time. Was the Stampeders a trio or they had their big band? No, nope, they were a trio and they were very nice guys. Uh, when we first got on the tour Rich Dodson came up to us and said anything I can do to help let me know. And yeah, they were very personable and tolerated as well. Nice. Okay, so back to Old Scratch. You played with them for a bit. Yeah. Were you the official drummer or this? this oh, I was one of the official drummers. Uh, Glenn Enns was uh, the guy before me and he was with them for a long time. And I was only with them for a few months. Um, with Old Scratch, it was when things started to change. Uh, you bring in your album cuts and they would say, well, no, Greg Delaron told us, play the hits and then uh, sneak in your original material. And uh, so that uh, if you played all the popular tunes, then you could play an original and, and people would go along with that. Whereas if you were playing album cuts and then you, you snuck in your original, well, it didn't go over so well. And of course the whole thing, which I guess everybody knows, people relate to songs they know. It's yeah. just easier to sell them, right? Oh yeah, well you know what, I'm guilty of that myself. So I understand. Yeah. Okay, so Old Scratch, this would be about what year? 76? Yeah, <clears throat> 1976, 77? <coughs> yeah, maybe 77. And so you were going to school at the time you were... In that band? No, I don't think so. I, th I think that uh, because, yeah, no, uh, I, I didn't go to school because of the broken leg. Okay. And so I played with Old Scratch. I had a cast on my left leg 
And so uh, instead of using a hi-hat foot, I would just tack them together so that it was one solid sound. And you couldn't open it, but it, it, it still worked. All right, and then what do you do next? Okay, well then after that, uh, I was getting prepared. I had applied to uh, university in uh, North Texas. Uh, which is a big jazz university at that point in time. I, I really figured I needed to play jazz. Uh, kind of went through that for a, a number of years. And then I, I ran into a friend of mine, Mr. Sheldon Corbett. And he says, well, uh, there was a gentleman uh, that used to be a prof at uh, the U of S that was now teaching at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And so Shel he had encouraged Sheldon to go down there. <coughs> And Sheldon was going to UNLV for a year, and he says, uh, so why don't you, you know, give it a shot? So I phoned UNLV, and uh, they said they were interested, so I sent them a tape, and uh, they got me uh, out-of-state tuition. So off I trundled with Sheldon Corbett to uh, go to Las Vegas and spend the year at university. And uh, really liked it. I mean... <laughs> Uh, September, October, November, sorry, September, October, November, you come out of your apartment, it's sunny, and it's 80 degrees, and you just go, have I gone to heaven or what? So, yeah, we, uh, we spent the year there and had a whale of a time, and uh, I decided I wanted to stay. So I went to immigration, and I said, uh, uh, what do I have to do to get a working visa here? And they said, what do you do? I said, I'm a musician. So they laughed, and they says, yeah, we need more musicians. And the one guy happened to say, well, if you marry a U.S. citizen, uh, that would be your best bet. So, well, uh, that was out of the question. So we're having a big year-end party, and I'm bemoaning the fact that I can't afford to come back. And... Uh, this one girl says, well, I'll marry you. And I says, no, we couldn't do that. So uh, thought about it for a couple of days and kind of percolated my mind. And I, I phoned her up and I said, were you serious? And she says, well, maybe. So we went to a lawyer and we paid him a fee and started to tell him what was happening. He says, no, I can't hear this. He says, but if you do this, 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 and this, it should be all right. So we did that, got married, and I got my green card. So I stayed in Las Vegas for uh, another four years after that. Going to school the whole time? Not the whole time, for the next couple of years. And as it turned out, I got a full scholarship the second year anyway, so I, I could have gone back, but being able to work was uh, just a bonus, or just uh, the gravy. I mean, it was, it was awesome because... Uh, at that point in time, my, my roommate was playing with a gentleman named Eddie Arnold. And uh, he decided he had to leave, and he asked me if I wanted the gig. And of course, I said, yeah, because Eddie Arnold was playing the, the main showrooms, and he was playing uh, oh, all over the country. So uh, I jumped at that and uh, joined up with Eddie Arnold. So for the next four years, uh, I played with him. Yeah, it was. It was very cool. And he was just a, a real nice guy. Uh, a lot of people won't remember him. I mean, he was really big in the 50s and 60s. Uh, at one point in time, I believe, he sold almost as, albums, as many albums as the Beatles. Uh, but he was a country guy, and he had a lot of big country hits. Uh, had an amazing voice. And how did that come to end? What's that? How did that end? Um, I, I moved to Los Angeles, or I was going to move to Los Angeles, and uh, so I needed to uh, sever ties, and so uh, I headed out. Never got to Los Angeles, ended up in San Francisco instead. Did you ever live with your wife? Not that one. <laughs> no, that was strictly a marriage of convenience. Okay. And, uh, yeah, but uh, that... Worked out really well, and uh, uh, I really appreciate her for doing that for me. Right. So now we're into the 1980s? Uh, yes. 
And what's next? Uh, well, just playing in, uh, I lived in Fremont, California, driving taxi and uh, playing with a little uh, local club band, and I, I can't even remember the name of the band. And that went on for uh, a couple of years, nothing really remarkable about that. And then uh, being married at the time, we decided to come back to Canada, so moved back to Saskatoon. And that would be 1984. Then? And things have changed quite a bit. So, uh, yeah, at that point in time, uh, now it, it all kind of becomes a blur. Uh, I, I ended up playing with a band called Special Event, uh, which was uh, an all purpose band, the middle of the road. Uh, we did everything from uh, rock to uh, polkas and uh, had a lot of gigs, did a lot of Oktoberfest with them as the Heidelberg band. And so it was, uh, it was good in that you, you had to know a lot of different styles. And so that rounded me out, but uh, it, was, uh, it was good. I adapted well. And uh, like, like now, I'm, uh, I'm uh, pretty much, I can play pretty much any gig that's out there. I mean, even the difficult ones, it would take me some practicing, but uh, I'm sure I could do it. I even, even played symphony work. Uh, when I was in uh, University of Las Vegas, I played a, a marimba concerto, which is a solo we're with orchestra, uh, with the uh, university orchestra. And I had to audition for that and then beat out uh, a lot of the heavyweight players in the university and, and got to play that uh, concert. So that was a real confidence booster. Back in the early days when you joined all these bands, everything was done by ear. Did you ever yeah. play charts with any bands? Oh, uh, when I lived in Las Vegas, you had to read. Because um, I, I played with what was called the Relief Band. And the union was very strong at that point in time. So uh, their contract said the, the house band would play uh, six nights a week. And then on the seventh night... A relief band had come in so you'd go to rehearsal the afternoon of the show the conductor would hand you a book of music that big throw it at you one two three four you started playing and if you couldn't read the music you're gone because there's lots of people waiting in the wings that could so yeah you got really good at, at reading uh, but yeah in, in, in Saskatchewan no uh, symphony you had to read, of course, but uh, uh, jazz bands, jazz bands you had to read, uh, played some different, well, and now that depended to, uh, if it was a smaller jazz gig, just a combo, uh, that would just uh, be by ear. Uh, a lot of the uh, horn players would read off of fake books, which had the melody in it and the chord changes. But if you played with a big band, uh, like with uh, uh, five saxes, five trumpets and trombones, uh, then that would be all by charts. But all the rock stuff was uh, strictly by ear. So, through all the bands you played in in the 70s, how, how much rehearsing went on? Not a lot. Uh, not a lot. Uh, Especially for drummers, I mean, and myself, like I say, I, I had especially big ears, so, you know, I could anticipate what was going on. If somebody cued me, that was good, but, uh, and I developed little tricks, like if there was a stop, I, I found out, well, if you miss the stop, just put in a fill, and it sounds like that was supposed to be there. But, uh, no, we did, uh, did some rehearsing with Legend, but, uh, like uh, Windcraft, Old Scratch, some rehearsing, but not a lot. Maybe, you know, once a month kind of thing. Who do you consider to be the best musicians you ever played with? I don't know if I want to get into that. Okay. Uh, uh, well, okay. Okay. Uh, again, the, the legend guys, uh, Doug Hergott had the best year and one of the greatest voices. I mean, he was all around. Uh, he, was, he was one of the best 
There were some guys in, in Las Vegas I played with, uh, uh, a sax player named Lauren McClung. That was just incredible. I mean, he played incredible. He wrote charts. He would listen to uh, a song and then write out the parts for it. And and so those, those are the two guys. But, I mean, so many great musicians. Just... Uh, I, I kind of do a disservice to a lot of people by even mentioning, you know, a couple. So what do you up to in the late 80s? Ah, uh, let's see, late 80s, just just gigging around. Uh, again, my main gig was that special event. Uh, played uh, some time with the Martini Brothers, Gil Campbell, Gene Cook, a little trio. Uh, and we did, uh, we did a lot of traveling with them, you know, LaRange, Beauval, places like that. Um, again, doing all the middle of the road stuff. Uh, they did, uh, a CBC recording in, in Regina. We did, uh, but again, it was all, no, I guess we did a, an original, but we did a couple of cover tunes too. So I don't know, uh. Nothing that really stands out, just a lot of different bands. Uh, I don't know, by my calculations, I figure that over my career, I've performed with uh, probably over 100 bands. And uh, that includes, you know, fill-in gigs and uh, all the, the Las Vegas shows and stuff. When did you get involved with the circus? Uh, in the 90s. Uh, I was working as a secretary treasurer for the musicians union at that time and got a call for a f guy from the circus looking for a drummer for a few Saskatchewan gigs. So I, I went up and did that and I really liked it. Uh, I mean, it was a totally different thing because, uh, not only did you have to play the music, you also had to do animation for the acts when they did their tricks. You had to accent what they were doing with, with fills and rolls. And so it was uh, the kind of gig where nobody ever uh, told you uh, play less. We got a, a cat climbing up the uh, cram around here. So that's a concern. Psst, go away. Uh, so anyway, I really liked that. And so for the next few years, I, I can't even tell you the year that I started, but uh, he would call me to do things, and I got to be the, the band leader in uh, Calgary and Alberta, places like that. And then finally he called me to do the, uh, the season with him. So uh, I went out and did that, and I did uh, four or five years. And uh, that was my, uh, my real on-the-road experience. Because before that, like when I worked with Eddie Arnold, he only worked... A week or two at a time, and then he was off for a month. But with the circus, we would play uh, play a place, and then we'd have to drive a couple hundred miles and set up and do the next place. <coughs> Excuse me. My voice my voice is starting to... When I do a lot of talking, then... Yeah. You did the circus for many years. Yeah, five, five or six years, I think, I did the circus. And, uh, yeah, played all over... Uh, the Canada and U.S. traveled as far south as Fort Lauderdale. And then in the, was it the late 90s, you released your own CD? Yeah, I released a CD now. Uh, oh, well, let's see, that was a whole thing I forgot about. Uh, when I came back from Las Vegas, I, I did, uh, did a recording uh, I had some original tunes, so I went into uh, audio art recording with, uh, that was Glenn N's studio, and uh, uh, worked with Doug, Doug Hergott, Hugh Mitchell, uh, Gil Campbell, and uh, Doug produced a session for me, and, and did, did uh, I forget, six or eight tunes, and so I produced a, a cassette, and a fellow doing some lyrics with me, Dennis Krentz, had some connections with a company in Montreal. So he sent this cassette off to them, and they liked it. So they offered me a, a contract. So we uh, 
<clears throat> had a, a 45 with two songs on it. Uh, one side was a song called I Believe in Love, which is a video that's on YouTube. If you uh, go into I Believe in Love, Rick Van Dusen, you can see that video on YouTube. And then the other side was uh, a song called Tonight. And uh, both of those uh, tunes were mine. Uh, a little bit of co-writing on I Believe in Love. And uh, it was called Rick Van Dusen and Cat Scan. And so we had a... Uh, a video that got, uh, got a little bit of play on uh, much music and then a, a single that got no play anywhere. <laughs> but uh, I have a 45. We, we had a box of 45 shipped here and uh, so at that time that was a, a pretty big deal having your song, uh, songs on a, on a 45. But unfortunately nothing ever came of that. What was your motivation for that time to be focusing on originals? Uh, just because I had ideas. And, uh, yeah, at that time I realized I had ideas. And then, finally, I became uh, musically proficient enough to be able to express them. Uh, I had branched out into keyboards and guitar. And so, uh, I became uh, more familiar with melodies and, and uh, harmonies. And, and so, I could put these ideas down in, in a way that I could communicate them with a other people, whereas just playing the drums, it's a whole different thing. You're kind of limited in, in that. Right. So what are some of the highlights of the last 20 years for you? Uh, again, the circus gig. Um, just being able to make a living playing music. Uh, in, in the mid-90s, I got my teaching degree, so I kind of phased into teaching and uh, the last few years uh, I spent in in the high schools uh, teaching band which uh, I enjoyed a little more in high school and elementary school uh, high school you can actually do some musical things with the kids and then uh, you can you can be a person with them and, uh, and they won't go crazy on you uh, as far as musically uh, I would have to take a couple of minutes to think about it um, yeah, uh, I can't say anything that stands out. I mean, you know, just just being able to play. Uh, last few years, uh, I played some fun gigs. Uh, I played with Oral Fuentes Reggae Band, which uh, uh, I had a, a, a blast with. And uh, uh, just doing some different things, uh, different styles of music. Tell me about a certain TV show uh, uh, host that you look a little bit similar to. Oh, Mr. Mike Bullard. Yeah, uh, yeah. When he came on, uh, <laughs> the the uh, uh, how did they say it? It was uh, rather eerie. The the connection that, that I looked like him, and that was uh, when I was touring with the circus. So. A lot of people would actually mistake me for Mike Buller. I remember going into a convenience store late at night and the the drunk guys being, Wow, we're partying with Mike Bullard and taking selfies. So uh, I uh, he, he came here to the uh, uh, TCU place, which at that time was uh, something else, I'm not sure. And... Uh, so I, I used to work there, so I made arrangements that I would wait backstage for them. And when he came in, I says, Mr. Bullard, and I shook his hand, you're a very handsome man. And he says, he patted me on, this, on the head, and he says, of course you think that. So I followed him into the green room, and I said, if I came to your show, would you work with me? He says, yeah, just tell uh, you know, the people that I said that uh, put you in the front row. And so I, I went to Toronto, and... Uh, he, he spent the first segment of the show uh, hassling me. So, uh, and then I was in a commercial for the next year, because when he came out, I said, handsomest man on TV. He said, sir, you just say that because you look like me. <laughs> and that was kind of fun. But then uh, he faded away, as most entertainers do. Did you ever get a copy of that show? Oh yeah, I've got it on uh, VHS, but uh, 
don't have a VHS player anymore. Tell me about your unique sense of humor. Is this something you've always been a personality trait? or is this Oh yeah, no. In fact, my unique sense of humor has got me into trouble along the way because I uh, didn't have the editing capability to be able to figure out what not to say. So I've, I've said a lot, I've said a lot of funny things. Uh, uh, I'm mostly a reactionary. I mean, like I can't stand up and just say funny things. Uh, somebody asked me if I thought about being in a stand-up comic. Well, no, that's, that's just not an option because uh, to do that takes years and years of, you know, trial and error and that. And, and uh, my humor isn't like that. But no, I said a lot of things that have alienated a lot of people along the way. So now I'm a lot more careful about what, what I say. Take that split second to think, is that going to, you know, hurt somebody or is that going to, you know, grate on them? Mm -hmm. So looking back at your career, which now is 50 years exactly. Yeah. What, uh, what stands out kind of as your best memories? Oh, uh, playing the Astrodome with Eddie Arnold in front of 33,000 people. Um, the circus gigs, uh, opening up for different people, uh, playing uh, some different gigs. Ian Eaton in Battle River was a fun gig. We got to do a, a lot of nice places. That was a country gig. He did some recording and had uh, some moderate success in Canada and just being able to uh, work with a lot of talented people um, playing in situations where you you fit in with the other musicians I mean when you're working as a team it's it's really great I mean you can do you can do a lot of things by yourself but uh, if you're tuned in with other people it's uh, it's great. I mean, when we were doing the, the jams with Legend, that was awesome because we were all listening and, and somebody go, oh, I'm going this way. All right. Everybody follow. And uh, yeah. And the, the fact of just uh, playing a lot of different things. I mean, you know, playing symphony gigs and, and playing uh, all the percussion instruments. When I was in Vegas, I used to play a lot of percussion. I, I played uh, a show uh, at the MGM Grand at that time called Hallelujah, Hallelujah Hollywood. And uh, there was a whole rack of percussion instruments. And for an hour and a half, you were constantly running from one place to another. You're playing a little bit of xylophone and then you're off to play some timpani. And then you had to be able to turn the music. And so I trained on that for a couple of months just to just to know exactly where you were going. <coughs> and that was kind of a highlight. That was just being able to play that. I mean, uh, you know that you're running with uh, some of the best musicians in uh, in Las Vegas, which conversely meant in the world. So that felt really good. Excellent. Yeah. Well well, it's been fun. I've enjoyed this. I've learned lots. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, okay. I'm so glad that I've had the pleasure to play with yeah, you Yeah, well, it was my pleasure, and I appreciate you uh, throwing all those good questions at me. All right. Excellent. Thanks again. You can watch this online, and I'll be able to share a whole bunch of old clippings I have of you with all your bands playing, too. Excellent. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Terry.